Okay. Uh, well, I'm joined again by Richard Lucas, the leader of the Scottish Family Party, a very interesting party. Uh, Scottishfamily.org, is it? Um, That's right, yeah. Scottishfamily.org, well worth checking out. Very, very interesting manifesto and, and, and so much more interesting videos. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking Hannah Gal, who s sadly can't be with us uh, for this, but by, by, by thanking her for her amazing generosity in, um, in screening this, this film as a, uh, uh, um, as a world premiere. It, it, um, it was originally going to be under 30 minutes, I believe, but she had so much material from so many people that she thought that had to go in that it ended up, I think, about 53 minutes. I absolutely loved loved it. I mean, I, I, and I think I, I I I freely admit to having been utterly obsessed and fixated on feminism for more than ten years now. But I think I think the the, the I'm increasingly realizing that, that 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 feminism is a cancer, but progressivism is is the bigger cancer, and and needs to be addressed. So um, I wonder wonder what, what what did you think of the film, Richard? Yeah, I thought it was really good. It was really good. I brought in a lot of the. Familiar faces for anyone who's uh, who follows these issues. I thought it's uh, it flowed very nicely, covered a lot of ground. I think for hopefully for a lot of people, it will be their awakening to some of these issues. I think it was a really good, uh, accessible presentation to people. So I hope it's viewed very widely. I hope so. Uh, I actually think it's got the potential to be more successful than the Red Pill, which is probably the last. Um... The last film that commercially successful film, I think, um, that 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 uh, MRIs, you know, just are universally, universally praised. So no, I think it's a it was a wonderful piece. You know, she's she mm. she, she you know she she's she's an award winning documentary filmmaker, and uh, I think it shows wonderful to have those really really high production values. Um, so let's start on some of the questions, which I, I think have uh, been posted uh, um, posted in the. In the Hoover window, <clears throat> which we're still having a problem with, so so hopefully everyone's coming over here if they want to ask um, if they want to ask questions. Um, this I think was from Douglas. Um, one reason I've heard for the phenomenal success of the gay movement is that they made things fun. People, whether or not they were gay, would turn up for their rallies because they enjoyed them. How can the men's rights movement be more fun? Well, I don't know, Richard. Could that be possible to be more fun than the men's rights movement? It's already the most fun movement in the world, isn't it? It's, it's difficult to imagine, isn't it? I mean, I mean, could you imagine trying to present these some of these issues under a, a banner and having balloons and a, you know, a, I don't know, a band playing there in the park or something, or kiddies activities, face painting? Is it is it well, feasible? Well, this is what's uh, um, hard to imagine, isn't it? <laughs> well, the, the, the next comments. Um, I don't think they're from you. The one that starts to get kids involved. Mm -hmm. So somebody says, get the kids involved. Face painting, balloons, competitions. Many men's issues involve children. And I think if we can show that, show that this is about a better life for our sons and daughters, it would destroy the whole, you're just incels that want to rape women, BS. Yeah, I think that's, that's a tricky one. Because part of me doesn't like the idea of using children in a political campaigning. The other political leaders and parties, they do it routinely. And I, when I say it, I normally think that's out of order. They should leave the kids out of it. So I would be really, really reluctant to have a political campaigning event that deliberately brought children into it. Now, of course, the genius of the LGBT movement is they managed to present themselves and to be seen as non-political. And it's the same with feminism. It's seen as non-political. And the reason is that all the parties who are elected uh, all go along with it. Therefore, it's not seen as controversial. Therefore, you, you can have kids along to it. You can teach it in schools, etc. But we've got to make it be seen as controversial, and then they wouldn't get away with that anymore. It would be seen for what it is. Yep. Um, ho hopefully, we'll hopefully we'll get uh, plenty, plenty more points and uh, presentation um, and comments. Um, somebody I, again. I don't. I'm afraid I don't don't know your name um, because of the window I'm in. Um, I am VP, Vice President of the Council of Georgist Organisations, named for the person who launched the progressive movement. I hope you'll stop calling these Marxist imposters progressives, because when they were actual progressives, the Marxists continually attacked them. The original progressive movement grew out of the abolitionist movement and stood for abolishing privileges, not creating them. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer this, but, but to me, um, progressives... 
you know, I, I mean, um, I mean, feminists are very much in that camp, I think, very much into sort of ge gender identity, identity politics, um, and uh, very much anti, anti the family, anti, anti Christianity, not, uh, not so much religion in, in general, but Marx, I know, was violently anti Christian. Mm -hmm. And anti-family. Well, he's you know, it's 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 the last figure I, I heard for um, the number of people who died as a result of communism was around 105 million. Yeah. Um, th th there, there's nobody in the history of the world that can claim to have been responsible for more deaths than Karl Marx. No, you can put it this way: you can say more people have been killed in the name of equality than the name of any other. Well, yes, ideology, because um, equality. It's just regarded as the ultimate goal. I mean, that, that's equality just equals goodness, yes. doesn't it? If you're fighting inequality, you, you're just obviously a good person. Um, yeah, and, and I guess the figure, I mean, I think that 103 million, if that's accurate, is only the start of the story. I mean, people, anybody who saw my, my, my presentation at the start of today will know that the World Health Organization estimates that more than 73 million abortions were carried out in 2020 alone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's 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 a number too 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 appalling to to even contemplate. But I mean, abortion to me is is a, is a prime example of of of, of, of you know of a progressive uh, you know of, of of a progressive stance. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it would be fascinating, wouldn't it? It's hard to imagine this. We imagine in some sort of parallel universe that abortion somehow wasn't a, a women's issue; it was just a general moral issue. How different would it be? I think it would be very dramatically different. I, th I think abortion has been pushed to the current level of acceptability, mainly by feminists. Oh, absolutely. I mean, th they've been the, the cutting edge of the public campaigning for it. So, uh, yeah, but it, it's interesting. I mean, what we've got to do is get people just to see it for what it is, to see it as a moral issue rather than seeing it as a, as a feminist issue. I, I all, all the media, though, right? and, and yeah. so many... So many um, women, men and women in Britain, do see abortion as a feminist issue. That it really is. Oh, it's, it, it, it's yeah, it's undoubtedly because it's women's rights. Yeah, that's the end of the story. It, well, it totally is, Richard. Which is why you know the theme of my video was that men are going to have to step up to the plate uh -huh. because this is this is the slaughter of the innocents, and uh -huh. only the men can stop that. Women are never going to do this. They 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 can be allies, and I, I, I was struck. Um, at the pro-life rally in in Manchester, outside the Tory conference, that that, that, that most of the campaigners were, were women, mm -hmm. and it was yeah. it was it was the men who were coming in for some criticism and so on from people. I mean, it's water off a duck's back for them, of course. Uh, so so this was the Centre for Bioethical Re Reform, and uh, they had three eight foot posters uh, side by side. Um, the, the 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 first of which was a woman sat on the toilet. I had in her hands and blood running down her legs because, you know, she, she, she'd taken the, the, the drug to have a sort of a home home abortion. Uh, the second one was of, um, of, of I think it was a 10 week old fetus. And it could equally have been a 24 week old fetus, which, mm -hmm. you know, but it was still very, very clearly human. You know, you can mm -hmm. see individual hands, you know, um, fingers and toes and so on. So, yes, um, let's see what we have in the in the Q&A. What would abortion rights for men do to society? I don't know, Dean, if you, perhaps, perhaps you can clarify that, but I think you're talking here about men having the right to uh, make abortions happen um, with, with or without the consent of the pregnant woman. Well, that's, that's just beyond horrific as far as I'm concerned in, in, um, in either case. So, so, so perhaps I misunderstood you, Dean. Um, uh, Richard, any thoughts on that? Am I just misreading it? Yeah, and we talked about this earlier, didn't we? I think it's it's a very tricky issue because the biological father should have a say in abortion. We don't want any abortions at all. But within a system where it's permitted, it does seem right that the, the man should be able to have a say, especially since the child is going to be his responsibility as well. When he's born, he's going to have some, uh, some parental responsibility to it. So I think it's a very tricky issue. And I, I think ultimately the answer to it is let's just change the culture, change society, so abortion is not an option. That then we don't need to worry about that, that no, issue because it, it's insoluble. I think. 
the, the, the concern I'd have, Richard, was that surely if you gave men the rights to, I don't know, demand an abortion, the abortion numbers would go up. I mean, so that 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 that, that immediately to me squashes it dead. Or it could be the demand for a woman not to have an abortion. Ah, well, that's something else. Yes, it, it, it depends quite what quite what he means by this, doesn't it? I mean, that that's a very uh, very tricky one. Uh, Steve, I mean, you can what? even imagine that. I mean, let's let's just think about it. Imagine it, it might even be a married couple who've got three kids. Uh, wife gets pregnant by accident. She says, I don't want it. He says, I do. But currently, it's just that the woman decides. That's it. End of story. But is that fair? Is that the way it ought to be? It's yeah, hard he, to see how to make anything else work, know, have another he, system that worked. But he's, it does seem wrong. He's tried to clarify it by by adding uh, just now. I mean that men can opt out, and I think he means by that that it can opt out of their financial responsibilities. Um, but again, to me, that would just drive up the abortion rate. So I, I couldn't I couldn't agree to that. Yeah, I, I would suggest I, I like the idea of calling sex the baby making thing. So if two people do the baby making thing, then they've got to be open to the possibility, even if it's a relatively low possibility. They've got to be open to the possibility that the baby making thing is going to make a baby. Uh, therefore, it's not OK for either of them to then opt out of that. If you want to opt out of babies, then you, you need to opt out of the baby making thing as well. That's, that's quite straightforward. Right. right. But, but once, I mean, you, that, that... once you do the baby making thing, you've got to be prepared. Surprise, surprise for uh, babies. But that flies in the face of individualism, doesn't it? And um, mm -hmm. that's that's that, that, that's kind of the, the first hurdle that that falls. At, unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. So Steve Moxon says, um, feminism is a subset of the wider cancer of identity politics and cultural Marxism and progressivism. The great long developing for a century now left backlash against the workers who have been retrospectively stereotyped and denigrated as first male, then also white and heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I feel sorry for the leader of the Labour Party all the time. I think they've got an impossible job. They're trying to appeal to the working class and at the same time, they're trying to appeal to the sort of middle class working for the government progressive types. And it's really difficult to hold that together. And I think recently they just haven't been able to do it. I'm not sure Keir Stormer can do it. I think he's trying to tread a middle line, but it's getting increasingly different. As social issues become more and more polarised, that's a nightmare for the Labour Party because it's just splitting their support down the middle. It's not great for the Conservative Party either, because they try and you know have a foot in both camps. So then both of them are, are, have got problems. What's happening is the social issues are becoming more and more important in politics, whereas the parties are based on traditional left-right economic policies. So the parties have both got a problem. I mean, if it carries on the way it's going, I mean, eventually maybe we won't have traditional left-right parties. We'll have Conservative and Progressive. What will be the difference? Well, there is, of course, I mean, at least in, heading the, that way. in the UK, there is no right of centre party anymore. For all this nonsense about this bile that people like uh, Nicola Sturgeon vomit over the, the Tories, yeah. you know, it's not it's uh -huh. not a, a right wing party by, by any sense. I wonder, yeah. Richard, if uh, just, just, just going back to the theme of progressivism, you're, you're probably in the as good a position as anybody I know to comment on um, on the Christian churches. I mean, of, 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 of whom there are many, of course. And how, what, what, I mean, the C of E, by common consent, seems to be dying, um, and evangelical churches um, thriving. Um, I wonder if you can give me your thoughts on, on the, if you like, on, on, on Christians in the UK um, and progressivism, do they, and yeah. feminism, do they understand those phenomena, do you think? That, that's a big question. Uh, first of all, you're quite right, that generally churches that go very liberal in terms of their theology. So they basically abandon traditional Christian teaching and just go with the flow. So they'll be saving the planet, Black Lives Matter, LGBT right. inclusive, whatever, they'll, they'll all those things. Churches that do that, generally they decline. Um, uh, and that's a pretty well-established fact. Uh, the Catholic Church, obviously pretty traditional in its beliefs as well. In terms of the churches as institutions, the general picture is that they're pretty reluctant to speak into political I think are not valid. I think they're basically not doing their job. They're not fulfilling their responsibility. I and mean, if you look at the transgenderism issue, 
massive section of society thinking, this is just absolutely nuts. What is going on here? The world's going mad. And the church has got the opportunity to say, right, well, what we believe is this. Um, so we also think that this transgender, we think it's all wrong. We believe this instead. So it's a huge opportunity, but they won't do it. They're too timid. They're always sort of hiding away. As if they're embarrassed by what they believe. Whereas the evidence is that when they do speak out on these things, it goes down well. And those are the churches that grow. In, in terms of understanding of some, for example, sort of feminism issues, now, the problem with those is it's often not clear-cut Christian teaching. So when it comes to like the LGBT things or assisted suicide or whatever, or abortion, most Christians will like look at the teaching of the church and they'll say, right, I know what I believe there. That's pretty clear-cut. That's it. When it comes to feminism, the link's quite not quite so clear. So it needs a bit of explaining why you know, what's presented in traditional Christian teaching in the Bible, whatever, that vision of like manhood and womanhood and equality, translating that vision into how to respond to contemporary feminism, well, there's a few more steps along the way. And I would say most church leaders would be scared to even begin to go along that road from the pulpit because feminine, feminism is so pervasive that they'd have people throwing the hymn books at them and leaving the church and, and whatever. It would be too controversial. Um, but, but again, even on that, I think that there are churches are missing an opportunity because there's so many people, perhaps men in particular, who are saying, look, something's going wrong here. Um, and the church should be able to say, yes, we can see what's going wrong because we've got a better understanding of these issues. But they won't say it. They're more thinking, oh, we, we better make sure that we're seeming quite feminist as well. Then people will think we're nice and they'll come to church. But I think it's the, the wrong approach. So they should be more confident in what they believe and be a bit more on the front foot communicating it. And would it be true generally of evangelical churches that they wouldn't have female ministers, would you say, or clergy? Uh, it's, it's a minority of evangelical churches that don't have female uh, ministers or elders. I would say probably 80% of them do. Okay. Some of them still don't. Right. Now, the church I go to doesn't have female elders, for example. And that's a very contemporary church. I mean, the whole network of churches only started i don't know 30 or 40 years ago uh the free church of scotland for example doesn't have female elders or preachers so yeah there's there's right. a lot of churches who still say that line yeah right right right, right. And the catholic church of course yeah yeah holding firm um yeah um so i, I think the the thesis of, um, I mean, just the title of Hannah's piece alone, Progressivism is Destroying Men, Family, Society and Civilization. That absolutely nails it in one sentence, I think. Mm -hmm. re 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 really, really quite remarkable. It'd be interesting mm -hmm. to see how, how successful it is. I look forward to it, um, uh, to it winning some awards. Uh, Jonathan Lambert, uh, hi, Jonathan, says men should have the same right to walk away without the financial responsibility of a child just the way women can through adoption, but it should be time limited. Um, again, I, I, Richard, I've, I've, I've got the same issue there that this will just increase the, uh, increase, you know, increase the death toll. Mm -hmm. I was just going back to what I was saying. If you're going to engage in the baby making thing, then you've got to be ready to make a baby and to care for it and look after it uh, for the rest of your life. But that's the commitment. That's the decision you make when you decide to do the baby making thing. Oh, that's um, my take on yeah. it. Yeah. Sean Goldthorpe says feminism will co op the churches like it co ops everything else. I think it already has. I mean, that's that's a large part of the decline of the Church of England, I think. I mean, um, I, know, I know a number of female Christians, a number of Christians, I mean, including women, who say that the female priests or ministers are, are a disaster. They, they, they don't have the same dedication to, to, to the job that, that, that the men historically have had. That's, that's a really interesting point. I've often pondered. Why is it? I think I think it is the case that the Bible does teach that um, there's a different role for men and women within the church. And it seems like in leadership, some leadership roles, it seems like they're supposed to be male. But then why is that? What's the reason? Um, my best guess at that is that maybe men would be more likely to stick to the orthodox teaching, even when it's a bit unpopular, even when there's a sob story in front of you, even yes. when the emotional pressure's on maybe men will be more likely 
to to stay on the rails theologically, whereas women might be more likely to be um, so understanding that they end up sort of bending the teaching to uh, to satisfy the needy people or whatever. Uh, but that, that's a guess, but that's just a possibility. And I would say that's probably borne out in practice. Oh, I'm sure that's right. I well. mean, the, the, the personality general, trait, the personality trait of agreeableness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, women are far more likely to be, you know, and it's purely a technical term. It doesn't actually mean agreeable in the way that many of us would use it. Uh -huh. But you know, they, they they wish to be liked, and uh, so that that drives them to sort of accept things, as you say, that, that I don't think men would. Mm -hmm. um, Greg H says, what about the funding that feminism has? Um, from what I hear, it's huge. So how can it not be political? Um, well, it certainly is political. I mean, it's it's been political for, well, certainly 50 years in, in, in the UK. Huge, huge amount of funding. Um, and, I mean, in Scotland, and, uh, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah. In Scotland, I, I, there's probably, I could probably rattle off five or six feminist organisations that are funded by the government. And they all present themselves as grassroots movements, but they're all virtually all of their funding is from the government and they spend their time appearing in the media. Well, they first of all go and tell the government exactly what the government wants to hear. Then when the government does that, they then appear saying, oh, they're really pleased that the government's done that. Um, they're, they're total sock puppets. Someone used the word astroturfing earlier on. I've, I've forgotten what that meant. I've forgotten that term, but that's what it is. So astroturfing is when you take something, put artificial grass on it to make it look like a grassroots movement. And it completely works in the media. So the government will announce something. And in the same report, there'll be a quote from a government funded so-called charity. And it just gives the impression, oh, the government's done something. That's what everyone wanted. So well done then. And they just get exactly what they want from it. In, indeed. Um... It's quite terrifying when when you join the join the dots. I mean, we had this hysteria about the tampon tax. You might recall, mm -hmm. and George Osborne. Um, you know, it, it turns out that quite clearly, what what inspired all. I mean, I think the average woman was paying like five pounds a year or ten pounds a year on VAT on sanitary products, and there were so there, there were all these sub stories about how women were having to use I don't know tea towels at work and all this kind of nonsense, and um, so so so. He, because we were part of the EU then, in, the, in, the, in those dark days, um, he, he, um, he decided that the, the, the taxpayer, i.e. mainly men, would, 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 would cover, the, cover the cost, and the money went to women's aid. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I'm personally convinced that it was just, a, if you like, a, a women's aid scam from, 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 from the beginning. You know what's happened in Scotland, don't you? That there are now free period products for women. Yeah. We've got a little plan up our sleeve to see if we can play a little trick on the members of the Scottish Parliament to see if they'll agree to something that's really ridiculous. I'm not going to say what the plan is yet, because I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. But give it a few months, we'll see if we can get any of them to respond positively to the stupidest idea you could ever imagine in this area. Okay. So well, I, I, this I'm, space. I'm thinking of having it in our manifesto in maybe February, March, um, basically to offer free sanitary products to, to, to women. You said you have that in Scotland already? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, we're, we're, you know, where Scotland leads, you know, the rest of the UK follows. Um, but, 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 you know, I think in the, in the interest of gender equality, there, there should be something for the men as well. Um, and, you know, purely because I'm a cigar lover who can't afford the cigars I used to be able to afford, um, I, I, I'd, I'd take uh, duty off cigars. Hmm. Um, the, the, the du I mean, you go to Europe, cigars are half the price. Uh, and it all, all goes back to Harold Wilson, who was actually a secret cigar lover, but had to smoke a pipe in public. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing with this, I, I, you, I'm sure you will have seen this. You follow every uh, issue in this line. But some um, feminists complain that, for example, the same, I don't know, uh, deodorant or something, there'll be a pink version for uh, women. Yes. And there'll be a blue per version for men. It's got the same stuff in it, the same size. But the women was one is more expensive. And this is an injustice. I just don't get that at all. I don't get it at all. I mean, anyone can buy either of them. And if if the market is shown that women are actually willing to pay more for these things than men, then that's the way the market will work. Well, it's just there, there's an opening there for someone who wants to put it in cheaper for women, just, but it obviously doesn't happen. It's capitalism working, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's fuss about pink razors cost more than black razors. Well, buy the black razors. I mean, for, for God's sake. Uh -huh. 
you know it's 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 like dealing with children isn't it um that's um interesting some interesting comments from sean um abortion is a fantastic way to rob women of joy putting a momentous life and death decision in the hands of, of experienced young women who have made a mistake they can't they can't possibly anticipate the full effects that that's really quite interesting one because i mm -hmm. understand from a number of people pro-lifers that women very typically they they i mean let's say they're a young woman uh that, uh, they don't want a child at that point but 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 they're pregnant so they go along to a doctor and they're pretty well put put on a on a on a, on a train put on a bus straight to the abortion clinic you know there, there's no there's no sort of exploration of what alternatives there might be and there's quite a few organizations now that will support women but but they never hear about them or they might hear about it after the abortion in which case that they, they, it just increases the regret it's 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 very cruel i mean i know the center for bioethical research say you know that, that there's that they talk about two victims the baby and 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 the woman but there's also the, the man as well who you know as always is is, is forgotten about mm -hmm. yeah and this idea of offering <clears throat> offering help offering an alternative I mean, that's what the vigils do outside clinics so in edinburgh they'd have you know a placard saying we can help come and talk to us we can, we can yes support but uh it was unbelievable the way the msps in the scottish parliament described what was normally a couple of people with a placard, you know, we can help or something like that on, standing on the other side of the road to the clinic. And one of the MSPs said that what's happening is people are being violently prevented from accessing healthcare services. So as far as she was concerned, a couple of people standing there quietly with a placard saying we can help or whatever. That was violence. Yeah, health, and, healthcare. And the moves healthcare. are to get it stopped in. Healthcare services. I mean, you, you know, you just know the corruption of the very thinking, don't you, that mm -hmm. they have to use such nonsense. Sh Sean Goldthorpe says it's certainly a problem if a promiscuous woman's in a position to point to the most compliant of several partners with um, I'm not sure if he means compliance or richest without a paternity test. Who knows who the daddy is? One of the things we have in our last mani mani uh, election manifesto and we'll, we'll certainly have in the future ones is compulsory paternity testing at birth. Mm -hmm. um all, all, it, all it will take will be um you know a cheek swab um that's interesting mm -hmm. because i mean it's i mean um estimates are all over the place but it's probably some something between uh, you know maybe 15 to 25 percent of children um the man who believes he's the father is not the biological father mm -hmm. i think the plus with that would mean it would really make uh, women and men think before having adulterous sex, for example. They would, they would think uh, think twice about that. But the negative is, will people be offended? If you've got you know, a faithful married couple, the fact that this is going to be tested by the NHS, I mean, how would I have felt about that? Would I have felt a bit offended that they think they're going to come and, come and check that? So, right, so I'm not sure, but I think it could have benefits. I think if it's present, preventing a deception, then that's a good thing. And it would also deter. Um, yeah. it would 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 deter it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a number of forms of paternity fraud, of course. And uh, uh, Steve Steve Moxon's book, The Woman Racket, I think covers uh, covers covers some of them. But I mean, pro probably the 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 most common by far is where a woman um, claims to be taking the contraceptive pill and isn't. I think I think Steve calls it upsing. Um, right. So, the, the, you know, the, the odds of a woman who's taking the contraceptive pill properly becoming pregnant are vanishingly small. So there's the, you'd be surprised how many of these miracles there are. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in, in surveys, something like half or, or more women say that if they were the partner that, you know, with, with a partner they valued who didn't want children, that, that, that they would commit paternity fraud. In uh -huh. fact, Liz, uh, Liz Jones, a Daily Mail um, journalist, famously um try 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 to carry out the fraud by using the contents of both her ex-husband's condoms used condoms um and, you know and you hear stories of you know pin pinpricks in the end of condoms and uh, uh -huh. and so on but but uh yeah i mean th th there is an interesting what's what's called um it's another example actually of where women are just not held accountable so the the child maintenance agency or whatever they call these days um, learn of thousands of women every year who claim that a certain man is the father of their child 
and it turns out not to be well you know the, the, the agency go to the man and he has to pay for the for the paternity test um you know if, if he if he if he doubts it and how many men will simply accept or just accept you know a woman mm -hmm. who says you know you're, you're the father yeah. uh but, but th those women are never prosecuted they're, 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 there's never been a crown prosecution of a woman for paternity fraud even when it's clear and i understand that there's a th thing that's in, in those circles called the slapper's defense and that that's where a woman generally believed that one man was was the father but really it was another one you know she, uh -huh. she might be able to limit it to half a dozen men who it probably could have been but uh so what's the score what's the score now with the paternity test if say a husband is suspicious and he wants a test done I mean, is that possible? Do you need to pay for that? Is it legal? Oh, um, a very good section in, in William Collins's book on that. It's a, um, I, my understanding is that um, a, a, a man cannot force a, a woman, even, even his own wife, um, sorry, his, you know, uh, cannot force there to be a paternity test on a child, even, even, even if he's married to, to the mother of that child. So she, she has to agree to it. And of course, she won't agree to it. Right. If you know, you know, if if uh, if there's a chance of paternity fraud being discovered, right. Well, what, what do you think about the issue of um, of people resenting the fact that this test is going to take place? People would be offended by it. It's, it's a bit like the idea that you know, when women go into the hospital, they sometimes say, oh, basically, are oh, you being abused? And maybe men will think that's they're really offended at the fact that their NHS would ask that question. Would it be a similar situation? Yes, sure. it's, it's 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 um it's a very interesting question. I had a very good friend, who, and he, he was really pissed off at the idea of compulsory paternity testing. So he's saying, so you're saying that my my two daughters, who are then in their twenties, might not be mine. I said, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there's a possibility, uh, and shouldn't shouldn't we shouldn't we sort of uh, you know do something about that uncertainty i'm not suggesting that someone who's got 20 you know um grown up kids should should find out uh -huh. at that point but uh i i have on our youtube channel um an interview with a medical ethicist um an interview by a woman of this woman um and she was horrified at the whole concept of compulsory paternity tests and said well you know it's it's it shouldn't be the right of of of, of man to demand that and of course, you know, you you do the gender switch. Well, how 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 would it be if uh, plenty of women were taking home the wrong baby, someone mm -hmm. else's baby? You know, and of course that that, that was completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it might be coming in any case because um, genetic testing is becoming more and more powerful. So we're heading towards the stage where I think genetic testing, uh, in order to look at uh, the likelihood of various health problems that maybe can be mitigated so i think there's going to be more and more of it and it's going to raise a lot of um, ethical questions as well like would parents like to know uh basically how their child's going to turn out in terms of lots of other capabilities as well because that can be determined by the genetics mm. so maybe genetic testing is going to come in whether we like it or not well they're, they're, and, they're, and this will be part of it there have been cases just a few cases of private uh private uh cases brought out by fathers who are very often when they're adult kids when they found out that, that, that they're not theirs um but you know they will not of course get compensation for all that they've invested in in them they'll, they, they might get twenty thousand pounds if they're if they're very lucky um oh. douglas says there's a 14 percent chance one for that someone asked to identify their biological father will be wrong um and grant said this is very interesting non-invasive prenatal paternity testing at five plus weeks is available now in UK Alpha Labs, simple blood sample from the mother to be's arm um, contains fetus DNA, which can be compared to a man's. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he also says, he's told me this before privately, one in 5,000 of us will also be wrong in naming our genetic mother. <laughs> uh, I don't understand that. What does that mean? How does that happen? I, um, I assume that's where people have been tricked into thinking that somebody is is their mother I, I um i know at one time people were often led to believe that somebody was their auntie oh right um, right right, right, right. But, okay yeah so they'd be brought up by a grand by grandparents but told that you know somebody was was there was an aunt but it's actually the mother you know perhaps she couldn't cope with it and uh uh-huh um
Um, so to Douglas say, so Mike and Richard agree that men can be cheated, but still say that a man should not be able to get out of being recognized as the father. Okay, so I think he's referring there to my objection. I think you took a bit slightly different stance on me, but my 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 objection to um, men not being able to force a woman to carry out an abortion or or, or walk, walk away financially. Um, men's rights, everyone. He's men's rights, anyone. He asks, um, right? But you know, it's always you know, it's men's you know, men's rights need to be balanced with men's responsibilities, and that's the entire point about feminism that it, it seeks respond rights and, and no responsibilities. Perhaps he and I will have a, a private chat later. To to to. Yeah, the more I think about it, the more I think that there sh there should be provision for paternity tests where someone wants one to be done or whatever uh, yeah the more i think about it the more that becomes becomes necessary because it's should sure raises... be uncovering a, 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 Sorry, a pretty, well, maybe even if it's not a crime it's a pretty serious deception yeah. sure, sean raises something here about which i i've got to say I, I i could be a bit more clued up on he says mike would this be a good time to consider the safe havens issue safe havens law in the usa allows new mothers to abandon newborns in places like fire stations to avoid them being left in dumpsters or boxes on the pavement. They can abandon babies without legal peril. My understanding was that in the UK that's possible, um, including in the case of uh, babies with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, they, 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 they can literally just, just, just walk away. And it's, it's, it's then the responsibility of the state and, and all of us as taxpayers. But I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, um, I'm not, not clear about that. Um, yeah, tricky, I mean, you, I mean, if, you, you can basically give your children away at any age. If you go to the social work department and say, you know, this 14 year old is totally out of control, is a danger to us, we cannot cope, please take him, then that might well happen. Now, the problem with the safe haven thing, it, you can see the thinking, it's quite progressive sort of thinking. They're trying to make it better for the one case, for, for the case where it's actually going to happen. What's maybe not been taken into effect is the wider message it sends. The wider yes. message it sends is, you know, this is your baby drop-off point. So maybe there'll be some women who'll think, all oh, right, I really can't cope, I really can't cope. I know the, the fire station down the road, they say I can take a baby there, I'll go and do it. Whereas if it was, I can't cope, I can't cope, I haven't got any alternative, I'll just have to get through it, and maybe a couple of days later she might feel a bit better. Um, yeah, he, he, he has the point that, that, that it would save lives at the expense of letting women away without responsibility. So uh -huh. I suppose, yes, that, that would hopefully reduce the abortion rate. Um, and it would also, I guess, you know, um, lead to a supply of babies for the huge numbers of, um, of, of couples who can't have children. Yeah, and they often want because, I mean, one of the, so That's the, the most yeah. popular option. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that makes abortion even more monstrous for me, that th you know, these babies are being killed at a time when there's couples pining, you know, for, for, for them. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's cr criminal. Um, okay, Douglas says, it's necessary to do genetic testing automatically to avoid men being pressurized by women saying, don't you trust me? <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. I can, I can see. The more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm heading in that direction. But You'll have to add it to your manifesto, Richard. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I'll ask to find out about if, if we have a safe havens thing. I always, I was, you know, I, I understood that we do. Um, I'll tell you what, I mean, in Scotland, that's just the sort of thing the SNP would jump at, because that's just their mindset, that you just do the thing that's going to help with the person who's already in that situation. They don't think about the wider effect or the message it communicates. Or they don't consider it that. It's just helping the the one person in the crisis moment or the two people in the crisis moment would you say scotland i mean with with the um with the fish face in charge um sorry a, t a terrible pun on uh, nicola sturgeon um i mean i guess the the body politic is that much more progressive than in in, in the rest of the uk richard would that be fair yeah yeah i mean it's, it's a strange thing if you look at opinion polls in scotland the opinion of the population is not really that different from England and yet by somehow or other when it comes to politics public life institutions it's wall-to-wall -wall progressivism 
it's strange. And there's, there's the assumption that Scotland is just uh, more progressive, more left wing than England. And in terms of the politics, it is. But in terms of people's opinions, it isn't. So I mean, maybe it's a form of, of a democratic failure. It's partly because Scottish nationalism is pushed on the uh, with the rationale that well, we could be even more progressive than we can now. So there's the UK, being in the UK is holding us back from going down the progressive road even faster. So if you're a Scottish nationalist, for, which is just, I think, as a sort of subjective emotional thing, then people tend to get caught up and then think, oh, well, that's why I really want it. Because obviously we need to be more progressive. But in the Scottish Parliament, if someone stands up and says, this is what we should do because it's the progressive thing to do, no one will stand up and say, well, I think progressivism is a philosophy with which I disagree. So that argument holds no weight for me. No one would dream of say that. They'd have to say, oh, well, no, I, I think it's not really the progressive thing. This would be the progressive thing. That progressivism is just taken for granted by everyone. And that will continue until someone's in there saying, that line doesn't work on me because I don't believe in progressivism. I think progressivism is a harmful force. And then well, I think, I think just in the last year or two, year or two we, we're hearing a lot of people coming together to say that, aren't we? And a very interesting amalgamation i think of religious and non-religious people hmm. um who, who are, you know i think on 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 the dangers of progressivism i think are utterly on the same page i have to say yeah it's interesting a lot of the people who are in the what would you call it, so socially conservative camp now 10 or 20 years ago they were in the richard dawkins new atheist camp and then they were sort of debating with religious people and, and that, that's where the tension was but now I think there's a big, been a big change. A lot of the people who were new atheists are now social conservatives. And even if they don't believe in God, they're saying, you know, what we need is Christian values back. You know, we've lost the yes. foundation uh, of our morality in this country. So it's a real major, major shift. I, I agree. And um, yeah, I think I'm sort of in that, in that camp of myself, Richard. I mean, I suppose mm -hmm. I call myself a cultural Christian. It's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Uh, um, you often get um, Jewish people calling themselves cultural Jews. And yet uh -huh. you really hear people saying that they're cultural Christians. But, I, you know, I know a few people I regard very highly who today would call themselves cultural Christians. Uh -huh. so, so, I mean, I could you completely understand the, you know, the, the need for a, for a moral code, even a written moral code. Yeah, um, it's a fascinating area. The question I would always have, well, I always have for people who say, you know, I can see we need Christian values. And the reason we've gone off the rails in many areas is that we've abandoned a set of values that were found in Christianity and we need to get them back. But the question is always going to be, how can they be sustained? But how long can they be sustained without actually believing the foundation that they're built on? Because they're quite vulnerable then. Now, a lot of these principles, having said that, a lot of these principles, they can be argued for on the basis of evidence as well. I mean, that there's very strong evidence, as you know, for the benefits of them. But still, I think without the underpinning, then they're always going to be vulnerable to attack. When you say attack, Richard, by 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 who exactly? Uh, by people who have a progressive mindset, who might say that those beliefs are irrational. We've moved beyond them. We've progressed beyond them. That's what progressivism is all about. See, we've progressed beyond them. I mean, they're just based on superstitions. Uh, therefore, what we want to do is be evidence-based, rational and evidence-based instead. That's why we're progressives. Now, you or I know that that doesn't really hold the water because the evidence isn't really in their favour. But to the general population, they will tend to think the people who are saying, oh, forget all that religious stuff. We're just going to be very logical and rational. They're the people who may be regarded as a bit more credible. Whereas people who are saying, look, we think that that the most beneficial values, they're actually the ones that were in traditional Christian teaching. A lot of people have been conditioned to think, oh, well, that, that's probably not as rational. That, that's just tradition. That doesn't really have any value. I don't really believe those people. They're not as credible as these secular people. They're saying they've just worked it out for themselves. So hmm. It's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I think that, that would probably take an hour in itself to, to <laughs> unpick Richard. But uh, no, I, I, I just see... Um, I mean, I, I've been, you know, an atheist for close on 50 years, and I, I find myself sort of drifting into agnosticism. So I expect I'll get some flack over that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it, it, it seems to me that the abandonment of 
by 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 you know the abandonment of Christ Christianity has been a cultural disaster. I remember when I was maybe fourteen or fifteen years old, and I, I would tell people. So this is fifty years ago. I would tell people I was an atheist, and there was honestly shock on their faces. Uh -huh. Today, if you tell someone you're a Christian, you probably probably see shock on their faces. It's, it, I mean, that's happened in 50 years. This 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 it's an astonishing um, mm -hmm. so, so, so social change. Just astonishing. Yeah, just like you were saying it, that the question you had there is inevitably dawning on a lot of people. If they're thinking right, I can see that these sort of traditional Christian based values. I can see that actually they make sense. Actually, they're the things that produce the best society. I can see your sense in them. The question's inevitably got to come next. Well, where did they come from? Why is it this group of people seem to have they're claiming that there's some sort of revelation you know, that have been revealed to them by a how of power? So if inevitable, people are going to start thinking, well, you know, maybe there's something in that. If, if this seems to be where the right ideas are coming from, then maybe, you know, maybe it is a bit more credible. Uh, and I think a lot of people are going down that, that line, which, which I, I, as a Christian, would very much encourage. But whether people go down that line or not, still, the evidence points in this direction. The, the evidence is the, the facts of life are conservative, as one of my friends. Puts yes, it. I, I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, Philip Davis always says that uh, conservatism is really it's a simple thing. It, it's, it's about conserving what works. Um, uh -huh. no, uh, uh, no, sorry. How does he put it? Um, it's, it, it says conservative is, is if it's not necessary to change something, it's necessary not to change. Uh -huh. And uh, whereas progressives, they always change is their number one thing, isn't it? Some some yeah. interesting um, comments here from Douglas Wallace. If the men's rights movement starts with an anti-progressive stance, it will lose a lot of supporters. Many pe many people, many MRAs consider the, themselves progressive yet support men's rights and fight feminism. This might just depend on what one's definition of progressive is. I realize you're both politicians, uh, but men's rights belong to people regardless of their left right wing politics. Com com completely agree. But it seems to me that so many of the major things that we're campaigning on and you're campaigning on, Richard, uh, abortion, the family, you know, just so, so much of that falls very much in the progressive camp, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think virtually every issue that's presented under the progressive banner feminism. virtually every issue that's presented under the banner of feminism i think that's actually not right same with progressivism if i was living in saudi arabia i would probably be a progressive i'd be saying look the society needs to move on it needs to leave some of these traditions of the past behind we've got to have a bit more a bit more equality and mutual re respect or, or whatever I, I would be a progressive but where we are in britain today I'm not a progressive. I believe that people who are pushing in what's called a progressive direction are generally pulling in the wrong direction. I, I totally agree, though. The problem with labels is, I mean, they're, they're inherently inadequate because no one quite agrees what it means and what's included and what's not. So one person might hear progressive as meaning you're against racism. Um, you, know, you want people treating with dignity and respect and, it, and you want, you know, um, high taxes for the rich and good provision for the poor that's what that's what you understand by progressivism i would say that's not actually the normal understanding of progressivism so sometimes the helpful thing to do is just try and avoid the labels completely and talk about the individual issues and then people know exactly where they stand but that's difficult because it just takes too long to say them all that you have to start using these terms it does but and you, yeah, politics you know, is a minefield like and, and people are busy you know they don't really have time mm -hmm. to watch 10 hours of videos on what progressivism is do they uh -huh. um, so, uh, interesting comments from Steve Moxon. Tradition is valuable because it's tried and tested over eons, and as with all culture, arose to function, to feedback, and to fine tune and reinforce the biology that gave rise to it. So it's yeah. a good reflection of human nature, whereas ideology is usually serving a sectional interest. A very good point, I think. Yeah, uh, I love a, phrase, a little snippet about that. I, I've heard that you know you'll hear people have a progressive mindset. To sometimes say, just can't see the point of this. Like, we can't see the point of marriage, so let's ditch that. You can't see the point of it. But really, you should say the opposite. If you can't see the point of it, that's not a reason to ditch it. Like, if you um, you know, opened up your computer or something and, and you saw a, a wire in it, you think, oh, I can't see the point of that wire. 
I'll just rip it out. That's not a good idea. You, you only think about ripping something out if you absolutely know the point of it. There's another illustration of a fence. If you see a fence across some land, you look around, you can't see any animals, you think, I, I can't see the point of this fence. I'll chop it down. No, no, you don't do that. You find out what the point of it is. Once you know what the point of it is, then you can make a decision. So I can't see the point of it, so we'll do away with it. It's, uh, it's not a good line to take. No, Yet no. You hear it so often. I, I, I agree. Um, we haven't got too long, Richard, but um, Sean Goldthorpe adds, um, abortion, family breakup, woke culture, what all these things have in common is making life worse. We all suffer so feminism can triumph. Uh, yes, um, apparently that's from G.K. Chesterton, your fence analogy, according to Douglas. Douglas. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you, Douglas. Um, Sean says, good plumbing analogy. The best plumbing is the plumbing that works so well you take it for granted. Yeah. Um, yes, good, 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 good point. Um, and I think I think we'll, we'll probably wrap it up there, Richard. Um, Thanks, very very warm thanks to you for for for, for joining me today. Really, yeah, really appreciate. What, what a day! Really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been really good, fantastic. Uh, well. And I look forward to. Is it on Friday that that your 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 um, your Friday video morning, releases? Yeah. Friday morning. And uh, so so I look forward to hosting that that Q and A. Uh, thank you, and th and and thanks to everybody who who joined us over over the day. Asked uh, you know asked questions and made comments in the chat. Yeah. Um, it's been been a very very interesting day, and I look forward to. Um, and well, let me think now. Another five days of eight-hour sessions, and then uh, just just, just a fi final couple of hours on the Sunday. And so, thanks very much. It's good. It's it's good night from him, and thanks. it's good. No, I got that wrong, haven't I? It's good night from him, and it's good night from me. Anyway, thanks, Mike. In any case, thanks, <laughs> no, Richard. Right. Take bye, care. everyone. Bye, everyone. Yeah, bye.